some on the outside part. Never mind. We will continue and uh, it will be sleeping warriors. We have Chris and some other persons going up to the States and our musicians as well. So, please give them an applause. Pulled him into the cave, 
took all the silver back and broke all his bones with their swords. He crawled out back to his village and he lived a miserable life. So the moral of the story is, if you have good fortune, use it wisely and never go back for more. I'm just going to give a uh, brief background information. Um, this is about the Sami people. Now, the Sami people, for those who don't know uh, what they are, Sami people uh, are an uh, ethnic minority group of people scattered around in Scandinavia and Russia. Most of the Sami people are reindeer keepers and uh, during the fall and the spring we move the reindeer herd from the summer place to, win to the winter place. And uh, what you're about to hear now is an example of how it can sound when the rain herd is, reindeer herd is moving, and uh, when they are, when there are uh, some shepherds watching over the herd, all right. Sounds. It was really quiet and fine. And uh, to you who don't know, he comes from Norway, so he's a Norway Sami person. And now we go to Belgium and uh, have a story that is written by Michael uh, Kirich. Und mir. 
o assunto, pensei imediatamente nas minhas chaves de casa e no sentimento duplo que tenho com elas. Há dois anos, decidi acabar com o meu casamento, mas depois de tomar esta decisão, tinha de procurar um novo lugar para morar. Depois de mais de dois meses, encontrei um pequeno apartamento cheio de sol, em tal aldeia, onde vivi mais de 20 anos, e o meu trabalho. Quando recebi as minhas próprias chaves, tive um sentimento do povo. Eu estava num momento importante da minha vida, onde tudo mudou. Claro que tive as minhas razões para acabar o meu casamento, mas porque também sou mãe, preferia ter uma boa relação com o pai da minha filha. Isto não tem sido fácil porque eu estava desiludida, zangada, frustrada. Outra coisa que encontrei foi a reação da minha filha. Eu vi a pessoa que acabou a relação, por isso a vida dela mudou. Habitar num pequeno apartamento comigo, um pouco longe dos amigos dela, ou morar numa grande casa com os gatos dela, seu próprio quarto, um jardim, enfim, um lugar onde ela se sente bem, não foi fácil para se adaptar. A primeira coisa que lhe dei foi um porta-chaves com as novas chaves da nova casa dela. E fico muito feliz quando ela me pergunta se pode levar alguns amigos para jantar connosco. Eu gosto muito dos momentos em que posso ver a minha filha rir e falar com os dois amigos. As minhas chaves são então o símbolo da minha nova vida, o resultado da minha escolha, mas também de uma grande confusão na vida dos outros. As mudanças que criei não são melhor para todos, e mais importante, terminei com a vida despreocupada da minha filha. Espero que ela tenha bastante força e gosto de viver para ser feliz. Eu posso me retirar para um lugar seguro quando ponho a minha chave na fechadura do meu apartamento. E gozo deste momento cada vez mais. Mas espero que o novo apartamento seja também um lugar seguro para a minha filha. Rice Krispies when I had my special care 
and the correspondence between us started to develop. Eventually, I couldn't get, I still can't get rid of him from everywhere. If I go for a bath, he comes into the bathroom and he sits at the side of the bath while I bathe. And so I decided, yes, his loyalty is there. I'll take him to meet my friends on our day, because we excavate on a Saturday. We're in an archaeological group. So I took him to do some in pain, and he sat over there. We went to walk around the castle, and he loved every minute of it. And he still likes scooby doo shooting around everywhere, and diving in this place, and digging that place, and shooting over to, to Penny, and knocking her off and everything. And then we moved from the castle, beautiful castle, down to a little uh, river, enjoying a little spot there. And decided to move on to a little Victorian tea room that we spotted. Being the nosy people we are, we go and investigate everywhere. So we walked up to the place that we thought would be quite interesting. And then terror struck, because all of us two men became the most huge, frightening, terrorizing dogs. A huge arsation and a rock diver. One of them was dripping, but he was growling and dripping with drool, and the other one was just surfing and swaying at the back of him. Penny was terrified, as we all were. David grabbed hold of me and said, Come on, let's go back, let's go back. But of course, they could smell my mummy's boy. I thought, What should we do? Do I let him off his leave? On any of his leaf, there's a road he could run onto and get knocked over. Do I do that? Do I pick him up? At five foot four, you don't pick a dog up when it's now safe and you've got by with that large from the after you. So I decided just to move back, move back, and the dogs were coming after all three of us. Penny was terrified, David was horrified, I was frightened. <coughs> but the dog, my little hardy bear, stood his ground. And he didn't want to move, and I didn't quite know why at first. Because, you know, he was such a needy dog. He, he loves me so much that he's got to have my attention all the time. And he's so needy that I thought he's going to be terrified, this little boy. But he just stood his ground. And these two dogs, one of the Alsatians, came up to him and he jumped on him. And he jumped on his back and he started pulling him around. My little heart bears this big. And the big station was this big, <laughs> and the rock fire was even bigger at the back of him. But I said, turn to, to Penny, and I said, if you should so upset, go, go, Penny. David, take Penny away. We've got to do this. We've got to see these dogs off because they'll have to my dog. So I pulled him to the side of me, and I thought, of all the things I could have told him to do, and the only thing I could think was what I'd trained him to do when we go across the road. And that was wait, wait, and, and actually just to freeze. He's got to stay still till I can say cross, and then he can go. When I say go, he goes. So I just said, wait, Harley, wait, wait. You see my little Harley bear up there? He really needed it, and he's going. And he did. He just waited. And I turned around and looked at one of the dogs that was serving behind me then, because that was starting to go from my feet. And these two had gone and they, they got away safely, thank goodness, but I didn't know what we were going to do then. But poor Holly Bear just stood his ground. And he stood there whilst this station just dived all over him. So I, said, I just said, cross, wrong word. He didn't know what cross meant. But he attacked this station. This station, five times the size of little Holly Bear, just cowered with fear. And the rock violet behind him just rolled on the floor and just, his eyes were wild. I don't know what it was, whether he, he was ill or something. I still don't know to this day. I just thank goodness that we got away. But Harley Bear actually fought off the Alsatian and this rock violet. I pulled him to one side and I started walking back again. And I thought, good, we can get away. Turn around, turn around to walk away. And the dogs attacked us again. They came from the back and started to attack. This time, I let go of the lead. Didn't mean to. I just dropped it. And the dog just went in through at the hour station again. And he then cracked. This is my little mummy's boy. That was it. The hour station just turned tail and ran. And I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't breathe properly. So 
I just got hold of my little Harley bear, and yes, he was bleeding a little bit. He'd got a few war wounds, but he was still as ugly as ever, so he got through it fine. We went down to, funnily enough, the little ice cream shop, and I bought him an ice cream as well as us three. That's my little tale. And then we have a wee girl that went to Mars. Baby. I'm not sure if I can call that very well. Hello. Uh, I was also doing the performing arts thing, so there's a bit of performance here. The beagle that went to Mars. A beagle's a type of dog, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, so questions. How would you get a beagle to Mars? Bit of a puzzle there. How would you feed it? How do you stop it breaking when you land it on Mars? Hmm, many engineers and scientists worked on these questions. So they got the beagle. Oh! Can I have my beagle, please? Thank you. This is the beagle. Many engineers and scientists worked on these questions. So we had a question, how do we get it to Mars? We'll stick it on another spaceship. And we'll get a piggyback to Mars, it won't cost us anything. That's a good idea. How do we feed it? We stick solar panels on it. Four solar panels on it. That means it can get free electricity. That's good. How do we stop it breaking when it lands on Mars? We'll stick a parachute on it. A parachute, attach it to it. Do, 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 float down. You'll be fine. So we did all those things. And the engineer decided to start. Yeah, we checked it out. Yippee! It's going to work. That's fantastic. So, just after Christmas, just before Christmas, 2002, the Beagle was on this spaceship. It sprung from the spaceship. Flew through space, flew through space it did, landed on Mars, little ball, landed on Mars it did, flying there quite happily, then it decided to deploy one of the solar panels, made that noise, deployed the other solar panel, deployed the other solar panel, deployed the other solar panel. They were all deployed, everything was fine, just waiting now so it could send the signal on this radio back to Earth. Still waiting, still waiting, There's nothing happening. Meanwhile, on Earth, Christmas morning, 2002, I wake up, Christmas morning, all these presents out, forget a present. I'm going straight to the computer. On the computer. See if Beagle's speaking to us. It's not speaking to us. I was a very sad person. Hundreds of scientists were very sad people. Now you might think that a bit strange, but the Beagle that landed went to Mars wasn't a dog. The Beagle that went to Mars was actually a spacecraft. And I built part of that spacecraft. And I was gutted when I found out that it went all the way to Mars and it didn't do anything. But a part of me was extremely proud because even though it didn't get to Mars, it got to Mars, it didn't do anything. There's a little bit of me on Mars. And not many people can say that, can they? No. And that's my story. Okay, now I can see with a call from Turkey can take us. Mustafa. There you are. Yes. I suppose that it would be at the bar. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that has already changed now. Okay. Um, 
that story is very new. Uh, it happened while coming to Holanda. <coughs> um, before coming here, I stayed one night in Stockholm to see around and to have fun. And while turning back, we were going to uh, Alanda Airport on a taxi. Um, I have been called many times by an unknown number. And I always checked it and then I didn't want to answer because I don't know it. And then again, again, again. Yeah. At last, I felt that I had to answer this call. And I answered, I said, hello. And the other side, hello. Mm -hmm. Are you Mustafa? Yes, I am. Who are you? I'm your neighbor. Okay. My wall <laughs> is your balcony. So we are going to go on a picnic and I need the ball. I said, but I'm abroad. I'm going to somewhere in Europe. Oh, really? Did he give your key to someone else in the city? <laughs> Maybe I can get it. No, I didn't. When will you be back? Next Monday, so you have to wait for that. And when will I call you on Monday? In the morning, in the afternoon, or in the evening? I said, whenever you want. <laughs> <laughs> this is really interesting. I come from a very small city in Turkey, located in the south. And I'm going to, uh, to the most north of the world. And a little girl is calling me. Just uh, she needs yeah a ball. Yeah. And while they were playing playing with the ball, they threw it to my balcony. <laughs> Now there will be a short technical break while they are uh, making things ready. And then uh, there are our, uh, students from the lighting course. They can do something out there. The story is called The Life of a Lampshade. students 
and uh, you see the stories become pictures, and we start with past, past, present, and future ladies from Belgium. I have just to tell you that last night when we were at Rosescaro, we were playing the magnificent Finnish game, Mölkü. And these two ladies, they won always. So, Exactly. 
afternoon, I realized I forgot something because I have, I have two daughters, so I missed something. My husband, I forgot it, so my family <laughs> he isn't here. <laughs> and now the dress is waiting for the next uh, generation. And in our country, in the Flanders, little girls grow up now and go to school, but don't make samples anymore, no bed spreads or crystalline gowns, but even some needlework is still made and delivered. Thank you. And is calling somewhere here, just a boy. There is our boy. good uh, because I'm Scottish. <laughs> it's taken me 60 years to learn how to speak English and I've still not got it quite right. I still keep on making mistakes all the time. I found out that as I get older I get more and more bloody confused by things. Everything seems to be a mystery, and I'm baffled and bewildered an awful lot of the time. I thought when I was a kid, when I was young, like students here, that as I got older, I would get wiser, but I don't. I live in a constant state of confusion. One of the things that really confuses me is modern art. <laughs> Modern art is a complete mystery to me. I go to art galleries and I look at it and I think, what the frig is this about? <laughs> and I think there's a, a Scottish and English expression called taking the piss. <coughs> and it, it's a vulgarity. But it means that the people who are producing the art, or the music, are just making fun of you, they're just confusing you, um, and making you feel small and foolish. And I go to galleries and I look at something like this, and I think, this could be the work of a genius, or it could be the work of an idiot. It could be a wise person pretending to be foolish, or a foolish person pretending to be wise, and I really don't know the difference. Saga and you helped me in putting this together a little bit, giving me some ideas. And I did, I think it's called a triptych. I, I'm not sure, because as I say, my English isn't very good. <clears throat> so it's three pieces about a friend of mine. It's called Just About a Boy. Now, if you were to go to an art gallery and look at that, what, what would you make of it? What would you think it was? Any ideas? A sign of it. You see, it's all in the mind, isn't it? It's in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? Any other ideas what it might be? Sorry? A palm tree from above. A palm tree from above. <laughs> it could well be. It could well be. I'll, I'll tell you what it is. Uh, because when I was drawing this, and I can't draw as you can see. <laughs> when I was drawing it, I thought, let's try and make it as simple and as symbolic as I possibly could. So, the white thing at the top here, what shape is that? 
Hey. Your mutta. Your mutta. Your mutta. So it's an A. And this friend of mine was conceived from a human egg, but didn't know who the parents were. So he's come from this egg, and the thing that you thought that looked like a spider is just life. Green for me means life. And the little orange and yellow bits are the buds. Yeah, you start off very young, green and jejun, if you like, and then little knowledge, little wisdom comes. And that's the yellow parts. I mean, isn't it obvious? I <laughs> know, <laughs> I've told you, it's like, oh, bloody hell. Oh, it's got to be it, isn't it? How did we not see it, you're saying? <laughs> We have number two, Sarah. So. Right. This is number two. Any ideas? <laughs> Any ideas? Yeah. Sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid. H2SO4. Anything else? Oh. Yes. Sorry? Barbecue. A barbecue? <laughs> Have you been drinking? <laughs> this is it. This is uh, the genius of, of abstract art. It can be anything you like. I'll tell you what it is in my mind. On the left hand side, you've got my friend, the boy, who is full of energy, full of life full of crazy ideas. And on the right hand side, you've got authority, school, education, repression. Um, my friend grew up in Scotland in the 1950s and 1960s, and education was very, very strict. If you didn't comply with the authorities, they belted you, they hit you. So, we started to get x plus y, mathematics, algebra, H2SO4, chemistry, a mole, a mass. What's next? Latin. Yeah, a mole, a mass, a mass. Latin. So all the teaching, pressing down, trying to stifle the individuality of the boy. We have the third one. You know the system now, what does it mean? <laughs> I'll tell you. Sorry? How to liberate yourself. A little bit. The, the boy is still represented by the red. The black was when he was very ill and had cancer. So it's cancer attacking the boy. But the boy... Resisting. Yes, resisting. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? People joining in. <laughs> Marvellous. Yes, so resisting and being stronger on the right with the links of the chain. And still confused, but not really caring whether he's confused or not anymore. And can you read what I've written here in blue? Like a bird on the wire. Do you know the song? Then the Cohen song. One of my favourite songs, and one of his favourite songs too. The next line of Like a Bird on the Wire is like a drum in a midnight choir. I have tried in my way to be free. So I would say certainly to the young people today, and even to those of us who are slightly older, just be yourselves, be individualistic. Don't let the system grind you down. A bit of Latin. Nil illegitimum carborundum. Don't let the bastards grind you down. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my story. Thank you, sir.
you, Colin. And uh, um, Kim, are you here? We go to France.
when I was two or three years old, one of my teachers said to my mother that when she did not hear me in the classroom, she knew that I was reading a book under my desk. Uh, and that she, don't, she did not want to disturb me because when I was reading, I was, I was quiet. My mother was a librarian, then she lost books and reading, and she gave, her, she gave me her passion for books. Today, today, I continue to read a lot of books, or I read a lot of internet too. I, I read some fantasy, science fiction, historic detective novels when I want to escape. Uh, I read newspaper when I want to know what's happening in the world. I, want, I read some technical books when I want to learn something. When I'm tired or annoyed, reading always helps me to escape and to stay quiet. Even if I have I have a book in my hand, I can see and dream about all the story I already read. Because they give me the love of reading, they give me the love of discovering new things, other opinions, and point of view. All the different books I read, even, even if they are novels, give me some element to think about what's happening in the world and what I want to my life. Despite I was thinking when I began to write this story, I have I, I have my I have in my life something quite important. To write a story about it. A lot of elements of my life had some influence on me, and I forgot many of these things. Even if I can remember all, all these elements, it will be difficult to understand the, their impact on my life. But the impact of the love of reading my parents gave to me is bigger than all others. It gave me the key to learn by myself, to discover other point of view, to understand the world in which I live, and to choose who I want to be. Merci Tim, and then we have uh, Philippe Sopal, Phil, Edward. Uh, my my picture of said that and they kicked me out of the room because it was an Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> so, as an archaeologist, what do we do? Um, and I know that the team from the UK <coughs> performed wonderfully well and they're all colleagues uh, and they've all worked 
on archaeological sites throughout the last 10 years or so. Um, and as archaeologists, uh, we dig down and we keep digging down and digging down and digging down and we dig down 20 meters and we find that one piece of pottery. Now that one piece of pottery we have to tell a story. And what stories we tell. You can imagine. So we're trying to create um, how people lived, uh, worked, died, laughed, whatever, of one piece of pottery. Impossible. However, 10,000 years ago, uh, the UK was joined to mainland Europe. We were part of mainland Europe until the glacier melted and created the sea between us. At that time, we were a common, a common land. Not a European land, a common land where people roamed all over, all over the uh, uh, northern, the southern Europe. Um, and then we became an island race. Uh, and we have certain attributes as an island race. Uh, and sometimes it takes a lot to break those barriers down. Um, however, one of the things that started to break the barriers down was barley or wheat. Because when people uh, developed the, uh, uh, the wheat on the grass seeds that were growing, all of a sudden people started to settle. They started to settle in groups, in family groups. They started to settle uh, in tribes. They started to settle in society. They started to settle in national, national, nationalities, national countries. They started to settle as this enormous individual states of Europe. Barley was the ingredient that actually started the European region that we know today. So the fields of Bali have created a, a, a European Union, but it went gone, it's gone back 8,000 years or so. This is not a recent thing that was done uh, 20, 30 years ago by the European governments. There has been a common purpose across Europe for millennia. So, on the fields, so, and that's the reason we're here today. So, we're here today because we grew barley. That's the reason we're here today. From the first seed, seven, eight thousand years ago or so, to Sweden, Aparanda, thank barley. <laughs> and it's gone from thank you, barley, and to the fields of barley, I think, it can become the fields of barley. Thank you very much. This part of our storytelling, and uh, we have one story left, and it's Borders and Malgosha from Poland. It's your time.
Can you hear me now? Yeah. My name is Nao Gosha. I come from Poland and uh, uh, everybody's uh, life is a saga. I won't bore you with a saga today. I would simply like to tell you a true story from my life, uh, which uh, in a way touches on your lives, but we'll come to that at the end. Um, my story uh, goes back to the past century. Actually, it goes back 35 years back. Some of you may not have been born at that time. Some of you were in different places. At that time, I was born, I mean, I, I was born and I lived in Gdańsk, in Poland, and I was a young student. I was a student of English philology who'd never been abroad before. Uh, and always dreamt of traveling, but uh, Communist Poland in 1978 was a, a very different place from uh, Poland now and a very different place from uh, Sweden or Finland, as you know it now. Anyway, through my brother's uh, friends, I got to know a group of four Finnish people who came to Gdańsk. Uh, we met, we had a great time, and they were on their way to Hungary. And uh, we sort of exchanged addresses, and uh, one day they wrote back to me saying, Ah, would you like to come to Finland? And uh, I was uh, ashamed to tell them, but I had to tell them that at that time, 1978, uh, Poland was still uh, beyond an iron curtain, and I needed an invitation to go anywhere outside the communist bloc. They said, no problem, we'll send you an invitation. Uh, which they did, you know, the Finns are very reliable people. And uh, the invitation came, and uh, I was just about to set on my first journey, but there were two problems. I had to get a passport, and getting a passport was a, was a really unpleasant thing to do. You had to apply for a passport, you had to uh, wait for that, you were, um, you were interrogated at the police station. They were making it very difficult for you to, uh, to get a passport. Uh, so all that was really unpleasant, but I managed to, to get a passport finally. Then I had to get a visa. And I was really getting uh, worried that I wouldn't get a visa in time for the ferry to come to Finland. But God helped me, and I was on my first border crossing to Finland. Uh, the crossing to Finland was actually quite nice and quite pleasant. Um, my friends in, uh, welcomed me in Helsinki. We had a great time. We uh, were, you know, seeing Helsinki and, and Turku and uh, and the south of uh, the south of Finland. And one day they said, "Let's go up north. Let's go to let's go to Lapland." And I thought, "Great, great! You know, Lapland is uh, is a magical country." So we. We got on the, on the, on the, on the, in their car and we drove up north for many, many, many hours. You know how long it takes from Helsinki to Kilpisjärvi, it was. Uh, in Kilpisjärvi, we started on a Lapish adventure and we walked through Lapland for two weeks. It was wonderful. I met the Sa Savo people, Savi people, yes. I saw the rangers and uh, I thought I was, I was mad. One day, uh, I heard some strange noise uh, in, the, in the background, and I said, what's that? It, they said, oh, don't worry, these are just uh, uh, NATO military maneuvers. And I said, what? Uh, am, I, am I anywhere close to, to a, NATO, a NATO base? Uh, and they said, yes, you know, they have their maneuvers here, but don't worry. I said, look, I have Maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe I shouldn't be here because I'm from a communist country and uh, I only have a Finnish visa. They said, don't worry, uh, borders are not like, like that uh, in Lapland. Anyway, after two weeks, uh, we, we, it was time to go back. And my friend said, oh, let's visit Norway. And I said, Norway? No way. No way. Uh, I don't have a visa to go to Norway. Uh, they laughed, but I was terrified because I knew that if, if I really went into Norway without a visa and I was from a communist uh, state, I could be arrested, uh, I could be kicked out of the university, 
my parents could be interrogated. My Finnish friends didn't understand a word of it. They laughed and they said, don't worry, our borders are not like that. What could I do? Jump out of the car? So I stayed on the, on the car and soon enough we came uh, to a border uh, between Finland and Norway. And uh, my friend said, don't worry, just sit at the back and you look Finnish enough, you know, you look Finnish enough. Uh, nobody will think that you're not Finnish. Uh, just uh, pretend that you're eating something or, or reading. And, but I was terrified, I was terrified. Uh, my heart was beating like, like, like a rabbit's, like a rabbit's heart. Uh, because I didn't know what to expect. I kind of, I almost thought there would be a Russian soldier just round the corner trying to shoot me. Um, we came to the checkpoint uh, with a soldier who uh, didn't look, didn't look uh, like a Russian soldier. Uh, he looked at the Finnish car, he looked at, at us and he sort of waved us on to Norway and so we went. We went to Tromsø and uh, I saw a whale, I saw the fjords, it was fantastic. It was time to go back, it was time to go back, I had to go back to, you know, to continue with my studies in Poland. And uh, my friend said, oh, let's take a different way south. Uh, let's go a slightly different way. And uh, uh, sort of, by the way, they said, uh, you've been to Norway, uh, let's go to Sweden. And I said, no, no, sorry, I, I, I can't, you know, I can't take another chance because I don't have a visa to go to Sweden. You know, I'm from a communist country. Uh, I don't want to see another border, you know, when they stop me and, uh, and, you know, what can happen to me? And they laughed and they said, our borders are not like that. Anyway, I remember going through a place which was, uh, you know, the sun was shining, there was a river, we crossed the bridge, uh, we went into a grassy bank and we went to Sweden, no one even stopped us. That was 1978. I did not understand how things were possible because I knew that the borders were borders and if you come to a border uh, there's something suspicious about you, you know, there's something suspicious about you. That was my, my communist kind of uh, communist uh, atmosphere uh, uh, attitude to crossing borders. We had a picnic uh, in this, on, the Swedish, on the Swedish grass. Uh, it was time to go back. I, we got on into the car, we drove back south. Uh, I went back to Poland. Um, we kept in touch many times and so on. Uh, in 1980, uh, solidarity strikes began in Gdańsk. And in 1981, uh, the borders of Poland were shut. They were shut because there were Russian tanks on our borders and we were not allowed to leave the country. Uh, but history changes. Uh, after three years of that, I was allowed to go out of the country again. I kept in touch with my, with my Finnish friends. We still do, we still do. And many things happened later, you know, uh, uh, Sweden and uh, Finland uh, got married uh, one day, uh, as I as I learned uh, today on the, on a guided tour. Um, then uh, Poland joined the European Union, and uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, we all met in Belgium, and I met Petra, uh, and uh, and this is why I'm here. Uh, and I called my Finnish friend. Um, uh, or he called me some time ago, and he said, when are you coming to Finland next? And I said, uh, I don't know, um, but I'll be coming to Sweden. I'll be coming to Sweden, which is not far from, 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 from Finland uh, in that part. And I'll be going to Haparanda. And he said, Haparanda? Haparanda? Do you realize that you were in Haparanda 35 years ago without a visa? We crossed the bridge of the Tornia River and uh, we were having a picnic in Haparanda. And of course, everything came back to me. All the memories of that moment came back to me. And I remember the feeling I had there and then, uh, sitting on the grassy bank uh, 
of, of, the, of, the, of the river on the Swedish side, that I would like to be able to come one day to a place like this without feeling um, afraid, without feeling that I was a second-rate uh, citizen, without feeling guilty of anything. And, uh, and you know, sometimes when you make a wish under, this, um, under the sun that never sets, uh, some wishes come true one day, sooner or later.